one two three one two three and i hope we are live as always a little bit of risk whether everything is working but i hope it is just have waiting for a confirmation from youtube okay it seems it is so hello everyone today uh, during our webinar where we will be talking about why it is so long like why dotnet memory expert is taking 42 hours to watch and it's the goal for today for answering this question so let's just proceed I'm super happy that you are here with me today. So as always, say hello from where you are, uh, from where you are watching, whether it is a morning or evening or in the middle of the day. I'm always curious who, who is watching me and from where. So uh, just just share this with me. I'm talking, we have a evening here in Poland. So that's the case on, of, of my side. So, uh, First of all, hello, Pavel. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, first of all, feel free to ask questions all the time to discuss, because as always, I would like to see it as a kind of interaction, not a lecture when I'm talking and you are sleeping. So just be with me and give you any kind of feedback or concerns and anything you would like to listen to about. Uh, listen about. So the idea of this course because we are talking today about the course uh, is just to give you kind of pragmatic approach to dotnet memory management so as you see i'm just directly jumping into the topic without uh, introductions uh, why pragmatic because uh, i really think after so many uh, workshops i have given after book publishing and before bu my book publishing i gained some I would say practical view what you are interested in and what are not you are not so much interested in even so uh, i believe we can have some kind of pragmatic point of view about what a regular dotnet programmer would like to know and maybe even should know about memory management so i'm having this uh trademarked by me four levels of knowledge that you can you can have about dotnet memory management so uh, the question is for you even when we are watching me now uh, on, on which level you are seeing yourself first of all there is a level level zero <laughs> which is just a number so don't stick with the zero number here but uh, i would say it is about learning so it will be at the level when you are simply saying what is memory in the end to do you have any memory what is variable what is the gc what the gc is doing i don't know anything i'm just writing code to make it compile and publish to the production so that would be something uh, when for sure you need i mean there is a lot of interesting stuff behind you and uh, you can you can learn a lot at this level uh, about some basic patterns and anti patterns so for sure uh, that's i would like no one is at this level I, I, in the end i would like to see everyone being at the level at least one uh, so there's maybe i would call it not one but junior level so uh, something around basics uh, and understanding some basics like understanding what is really a struct and why lean could may be problematic in terms of performance and whether you should use it in this particular method or maybe not or that the list has a capacity and so on so it would be in the end kind of clean code for performance like everyone probably as we are watching here today have read something about clean code no one wants to write shitty code in terms of readability so it would be something like similar for performance uh, not, to not write every something that people will be laughing at simply afterwards seeing what you have done here oh my god uh, so that would be something like everyone again probably i i would love to see everyone being at this level and this level also un requires some knowledge of abstractions uh, like a little bit of at least what the gc is and have some sanity checks uh, as i said maybe you can use struct here or maybe you should not use linku here and so 
So that is the level one. But we can go further because probably no one wants to stay at junior level. So then we could say about mid level, uh, level two uh, would be not only about this sanity checks of writing, but also some knowledge how you can validate things, how you can measure whether you have a problem, how you can diagnose whether you, so you have a problem and if you have, uh, how you can diagnose the reason, how you can solve the problem, uh, some knowledge about the configuration that you can have, like what are the GC modes, for example. So not only talking about the code itself and repeating kind of dummy rules, like don't use Lincoln hot pass, but with some understanding also and with good toolbox be able to solve things to propose solutions and also a little bit more knowledge of abstractions and then obviously we can go even further so we can have a senior level three uh, when you are not only about reacting on problems but also proactively introducing things so you will be able to optimize things be really memory aware uh, use advanced tips and tricks maybe use span here with understanding whether this span really makes sense here whether a span based api can improve things here it, whether it is worth to introduce them or not how to validate if introducing it was beneficial so that would be the level uh, everyone i would love to be <laughs> but unfortunately probably uh, we have so many you know uh, topics in dotnet that maybe not everyone will be uh, able to be here maybe you will specialize in some other topics like um, architecture or testing or whatever but at least level two, I believe everyone should really be able should be able to stay and sustain in any project that it is participating. And then we have a level four, which is like an expert in this topic, which means you are sleeping with books about GC, writing books about GC, or writing your own GCs. That's that's not the level that is popular and not everyone should be there probably because it is only for people that are really really interested in this particular topic so the main goal of this whole course is for me to convince you that you can really benefit from being at mid-level and kind of aspiring senior because uh, it is staying at level zero or eleven, even level one is not enough in my perception uh, to feel comfortable when doing things exactly the same thing we could apply for other important aspects of dotnet programming obviously so it is not only about memory management the same is for uh, for example async and multi-threaded programming so exactly the same levels we could apply to our async expert course, for example, whether you feel comfortable on those topics also and on which level you are seeing yourself. My goal in this particular course was just to uh, make uh, something that would be available for everyone to start even from level zero and become level, level three. And I really believe uh, this is something like it is possible. I am really proud of a uh, level of material that has been done by me and uh, the number of lessons, the number of slides and all everything, what, are, what, what is there inside is for doing exactly that. And that's why it is pragmatical. Uh, one could ask, uh, what is this? We will return to this question. I was even seeing it on the chat. What is the comparison to my book, which is orders of magnitude cheaper, for example. So one of the differences is this approach, like the bo book is book, like book is for throwing at every, every possible knowledge at you, uh, including internals and a lot of academical stuff and so on. Uh, that's super nice if you really want to dig in into that uh, in a super comprehensive way. On the other hand, when I was doing this course, I was just re-architecting everything, having in mind this pragmatical approach, those levels to make it happen that you are starting at week, week zero, at week, week one or whatever, and then 
you are progressively adopting more and more knowledge and you feel like uh, this meet at least at the end with some aspiring knowledge to be a senior to understand this span stuff memory stuff and others so that was the goal and that how this all stuff has been created as i said so we have dotnet memory expert and uh, previous webinar was about uh, and it was like uh, saying i will be doing I, I will be doing that i will be doing this this webinar is about what i have done because it is like i have finished producing this course it is already available you can buy, buy it uh, even today and you will gain access to all the modules so now i can summarize what's inside in the end what i was able to do during all those two three months uh, since the previous webinar so the whole idea about this pragmatical stuff in the end ended as 14 modules as you see here uh, so uh, initially as far as i remember i was planning to have nine modules but it was just too small number of modules to those would be too big simply so i split it I split some modules into two or even three modules. In the end, I have 14 and one additional. And then I'm covering a lot, a lot of important topics, all about, uh, all about, uh, something is slow here, all about regrouping all the topics from my book and from workshops that I have given. So every card here is a topic that I have discovered should be covered. I throw it all on the <laughs> on this uh, mirror.com board and regrouped it in a way that will allow us to introduce those this all knowledge in a more pragmatical way. So the ta table of contents of a book has been totally uh, randomized here and re or rearranged to produce something different and uh, introduce various topics in different order because I just believed after all this experience that uh, there can be bit better order of introducing uh, topics than the one it is in the book, especially when we are talking about pragmatical practical interactive kind of interactive thing like course when you are watching i'm presenting demos so it is a different pace of learning than just reading book chapter by chapter page by page so that was the plan uh, as you see i have marked everything as green, green tick so they have been covered some i moment uh, because in the end i <laughs> i was just afraid of not doing uh, not ending it in a no any limited time if i would just to cover everything that i would like to cover but in the end they are really really small topics that i have omitted uh, those black boxes here uh, all the rest is there inside the course and uh, I was really happy in the end that uh, I started to produce it uh, during the time of .NET 6 uh, because I was able to catch up and introduce all the newest APIs from .NET 6 that were introduced uh, during this, especially on the topics of the span related APIs and other stuff, all is there. Uh, so that was good for the course itself and other stuff that have been changed during the uh, all the time after book publishing like uh, much more topics of the linux diagnostics and how linux is different on this uh, area of diagnostic comparing to windows and moreover obviously more practical examples like having my book into also contains demos, but demos in a book is something really boring. It is still text. You are reading some theory, then you are reading some code, and then you are reading a demo, but it is all the same boring wall of text. So demos in case of course is totally different thing. I can present interactive things, present how you can get to something step by step using various tools. So that's the diff another different, big difference comparing to a book. And uh, in the end, all those modules have been already delivered uh, because we have this one week per week pace of introducing modules. There is only one week left that will be 
when mo one module that will be published next week and that will be all like uh, next in the end next week all modules will be available and you will be able to learn in your own pace because then everything will be available uh, already and you can just learn as fast as you want week by week or even faster or even slower it doesn't matter for us like it is just available for you and you can follow as you may as you are available as as you have time and so on <clears throat> So uh, I, I'm even surprised, but in the end, those numbers are pretty big. So it turned out that I had 42 hours of presentations and demos that were recorded during that time, which simply means considering all the repeats and all the raw material that has been delivered, I recorded around more than 50 hours for sure, uh, which is a lot of <laughs> hours talking to microphone uh, but in the end it has a pretty nice average of three hours per module so we have 14 hours 14 modules uh, then around three hours per module so it is not overwhelming uh, it is you should be able to catch up if you'd like to all obviously as i said all those modules are available so you can just watch two weeks uh, or three weeks a single module but still those three hours i believe it is a really nice result and also a really big number of slides like all, all 1383 slides in the end of materials uh, about memory management which is bigger than the pages of my book which is another lifetime record and I'm really happy with those slides like when doing various trainings again even after book publishing I was fully aware what parts are not so maybe well covered and I covered all those holes with new slides and I'm really satisfied with that because now I feel everything I wanted to sh show at the slides is available as the slides uh, so that's really nice. <clears throat> Also homework, another very nice thing, of, because a book is not so good. I, I mean, we can have obviously exercises in every book, but I believe interactive, let's say almost interactive way of cooperating with course is much better for having homework. So we put a lot of attention to have a homework for you at the end of every module and not after, you know, listening all those three hours of me talking about all spans, memory generations. Uh, you have an opportunity, which is optional because we don't measure it, uh, because we trust it's your your millage your my your millage may vary here how you would like to approach it. But you have uh, this homework, uh, which should take around half an hour, maybe longer, maybe shorter. If some participants are here, you can say what is the time average time of your homework. But still, you have something you can use a problem to measure a little bit of code to write uh, with some solutions that are provided afterwards so uh, yet more material to work on and then uh, some links as always uh, as we will I, I will show you in just in a second how it in the end looks and how our platform looks so just stay tuned and i said here that it is a 14 plus plus one module because there is one additional module with our uh, mentors so we have a christoph we have andre which is author of benchmark.net and christoph also is well known speaker are in the topics of memory uh, awareness and diagnostics so we have this additional module still and one and also it will contain q a with me that is the live q a about all the stuff covered in the course which will happen this friday so uh, that, that's one the very last thing i need to make to cover all the material in this uh, in this edition and in the in the next upcoming editions uh, so the very important thing here also is that we have a you have a lifetime access for all this so there are pretty often some questions okay but i don't know whether i will be having time now or maybe i would like to start next month 
uh, how it will happen. So in the end, it doesn't matter when you will start, you have a lifetime access. Uh, it also includes future upgrades uh, because for sure .NET team will change something. We are aware of uh, upcoming changes in .NET 7 uh, that will change pretty a lot. I, I mean, maybe not in terms of the topics covered in a book, but some internals of the GC will change, which may change some uh, behaviors in .NET 7 uh, applications. So this course probably will need some upgrades uh, after at least publishing .NET 7. And the community. So always we are we are inviting you to talk with each other, not we only with us, but with the community itself. So you can always discuss. We are just providing a platform for that. Uh, so before going to a demo, one of the, for example, uh, topics and some demos that let's say to make some live demo of based on the topics that we have covered in the in the course itself all i just wanted to make th this opportunity to use this opportunity also to show you how this platform in the end looks uh, so you what you will gain access to after buying this stuff so uh, in the end uh, it is this platform that you will have all the lessons grouped into those uh, modules every lesson is tracked when where where you are uh, inside the lesson you can watch you will, will <laughs> you will watch my face a lot of hours because we are having this approach that we have slides with face so if you will decide to buy it you will just have opportunity to watch my face a lot of uh, time and then all those modules are grouped into the particular topics so uh, as always uh, starting from some very simple base <laughs> maybe not so simple but from fundamentals things like what is the dot net runtime itself and here we have at least you see a very big lesson which is almost three hours talking about uh, various topics comp uh, simply about the dot net itself like what is the assembly what is the um, common intermediate language what it is the relation of it to the memory management what the jit in the end is doing some stuff that is really important to have some basic understanding we come back to il for example sometime in next modules so having an understanding on this level is really beneficial too and in the end uh, it took over almost three hours to, to cover that stuff. Then we are having super important and pretty often mentioned topics like, for example, value versus reference types, stack versus heap. And, uh, you know, I really draw, like drawing. So <clears throat> I put a lot of work for drawings trying to cover and i believe really that picture is worth thousand words so instead of showing some words i'm just making drawings like that and under uh, explaining what is really happening when for example exec you you execute your application right and uh, to have a full understanding what is the relation between the stack frame the stack the managed heap and also i covering topics of registers simply uh, i believe this is not a there's rocket science Re really everyone can understand that and just by watching this uh, for example how the single method execution looks from this perspective you will be able to really understand once for a lifetime how it is all working and you will be done uh, this doesn't require <laughs> having a postdoctoral uh, job it is just a little bit of concentration some drawings and you will be just uh, fine with understanding all this and this pays off later on when talking about why in the end utilizing st sp stack for example is so beneficial so what the stack is in the end and what is the stack frame what does it mean to allocate inside the stack frame so those are the topics pretty low, uh, low level i would say but still i'm really 
I put a lot of effort also to not overwhelm you with assembler and really not needed stuff. So topics, I'm touching those topics a little, but to not, to, to not scare you and uh, not too much. And other stuff like miscellaneous topics, like for example, what the null, what null is, what is the difference between array and list of classes versus uh, array or list of structs, and so on. So that would be the introduction. And then we go various other stuff. If you feel interested, just go to the .NET uh, memory expert com site and then you have a list of all the topics uh, as you see the platform itself is really nice so uh, you will be able to navigate the progress is tracked and so on in the end if you really put attention to such stuff you will get a certificate of finishing it uh, so then you will be able to show it someone uh, if, if you if you care uh, what I'm really proud of also in this is those pragmatical approach. So, for example, there is a whole dedicated module for typical problems. Uh, after introducing all the necessary stuff, like, for example, what is generations, what are the routes, what are the diagnostic tools that we can use, uh, typical problems from my own experience. So after helping dozens of, maybe not dozens, but uh, maybe even dozens, I, I don't count, but let's say after helping some customers and also after giving all the workshops, I know what are those typical problems. So I regrouped all of them and uh, put them in an order of significance. And after a lot of thinking, I was in the end, thing, I, I thought, okay, one of the most common, uh, let's say, uh, considerations or confusions is that people assume they have a memory leak, but in the end they don't have a memory leak. It is just the scenario that there is no GC and it may happen because we have something like, you know, um, what is uh, what is the aggressiveness of the GC and so on and so how we can control it in what scenario the GC may not be triggered even when our application is consuming gigabytes of memory which would like, like would look like a memory leak but it is not a memory leak in the end so also another thing memory leak because of fragmentation and so on and so on <clears throat> So typical problems. Also, I'm proud of the allocations uh, allocations module, which is all about how you what are the sources of allocations and how you can avoid those allocations if you care. Like obviously, uh, on you should care only on hot paths if you see that there is a problem of with allocations. But still, uh, with all this knowledge from this module, you should be aware of those common sources of allocations. So after covering how you can measure those things and let's say uh, with the help of what tools and what those tools are underneath using uh, then we are saying about for example structs so we can say okay so in the end a struct is a way of avoiding allocations because we understand what is this stack frame and so on and then we can cover stuff like for example uh, when in what scenarios we can use uh, structs even we don't need to define them because we have value task for example uh, that may be used instead of a task which have some consequences but one of them and one of the benefits is that we have we have reduced the allocations on in, in, in case of some scenarios so uh, and also value task pooling, how it connects with pooling, which is also de described in the previous module. So a lot of those topics that I would like to uh, see uh, that people understand when writing everyday code, but also as promised, something for aspiring experts. So uh, the beloved span and memory, because uh, obviously, uh, we have a lot of hype about span and memory currently. So uh, almost two hours talking about span in what scenarios it can be useful and uh, what it really means that we have a span what it gives us and uh, a lot of topics about that 
probably a separate course could be dedicated for writing a code that is full of spam but that was not the goal of it like i was really tempted to do that but i was really you know blocking myself to not do that because i really believe Span is awesome, but it is not something that we are using in everyday programming uh, when we design our domain. So to not overwhelm you with the knowledge that you won't be using, I really believe this module is good enough in terms of the knowledge. Like you will be able to understand it. You will be able to play with it uh, during the homework. And then with all this knowledge, you should be able to, to, to understand whether you should use it in this particular scenario or maybe not. And uh, just a kind of uh, additional thing, a little bit about low level stuff, which is really think not so often used, uh, like the whole data oriented design thing, how we can uh, write a software that is all about memory access patterns and understanding first of all, why those patterns are like that. So describing what is in the end the hardware that you are using and also uh, how you can utilize it even in the case of .NET, which is pretty high level environment, but still you have some control, for example, about the object layout and it can directly influence the result because of cache access patterns and so on. So <laughs> this is a kind of super, super fast overall grasp of all these materials in the end it is 42 hours and when someone is seeing okay 42 hours about memory management that's crazy probably it is just don't call gc collect and don't allocate and what what in the end can be said for 12 for 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 sorry for for 42 hours about the topic it is like we can talk a lot about it uh, I was still missing some topics, omitting some topics, just not to make this 80 hours long because it would be insane. I believe those 42 are good enough compromise about, you know, compromise between the level of knowledge, number of things that we are introducing, comparing to the possibility that someone will ever end it and will be able to watch it uh, as, uh, as a whole. <clears throat> Also, uh, we have these communities, as I mentioned, so then you can uh, jump in and have a question and we, I'm answering other people's are, uh, people are discussing. So there will be always possibility to have this interactivity, which is another super nice thing uh, comparing to a book, uh, because although books should have and could have a forum like that, it is not the common practice. So we don't have something like, like that for books. And uh, here we have it. So we have a community of people that is just attending this course and we are willing to help. Everyone is willing to help each other. <clears throat> so in the end, I'm really happy uh, with the result. A lot of those things that were covered and I don't have a feeling that I have omitted something really important and and period like I I'm I I have I happy that I have delivered that and in that words I would like to present you for example some demo uh, how in the end what, what what I have presented in one of three modules in the end because the demo that I will be presenting here is Mm, used in three various modules and that's pretty common like we are building i'm using one of the projects on in almost all modules this demo is using one of the projects that is used in at least three modules and the idea is about allocation in this case so about uh, controlling allocations measuring them and getting rid of them if they are problematic <clears throat> One of, in one of the first modules, I'm even mentioning that uh, clearly to have this good practice that you should always start from measuring 
so if you have a code like that here trying to understand what it is doing and you see something that will be allocating it is not a good approach to get rid of this allocation just because you see it is an allocation because we don't know whether it is a problem or not we should always start from measuring to understand the hot paths to understand what are the parts of the applications that may be severe on this manner or whether they allocate a lot or maybe okay we have some big allocations here or there but it is so rare that we should not care and uh, that's the case for this application so mm, the goal of this application is to count the number of uh, unique words based on books uh, there is this very nice site site which is called got gutendex uh, let me just show it so we let's use it here and the idea is simple we have some books here and uh, then inside it we can uh, list there is a lot of books that are available in this uh, particular site and uh, what is really nice here is that they can uh, they are in various formats including the text plane one so for example uh, we can filter out the one that we are just in the text uh, plain format i'm doing this uh, in my program so the goal is here to call all in the end books that are available in the text plain format get all those files which are txt files simply here we are having a book which is um, which is pride and produced pre just this sorry i'm not native speaker so sorry for for this and uh, here we have it uh, we have the whole book in the text format so it is easy very easy to download and then count the number of unique english in this case words and the goal is simple, but uh, as we will see, it may introduce more or less allocations depending how we will write our applications. So the very first approach is, OK, we have an URL of the filter. So it is just uh, giving us all the books that are in English that are available in the plain text. And then using some ANSI consoles from spectre.console to print it nicely, we are starting our processing. Our processing here is uh, to get the list of those uh, books. Uh, the result is paged, so then we will be just processing it page by page. And uh, we are asking from the, for, for those results as you see here so in the end we have the endless loop here uh, when the page will be just the next page won't be available we will be just simply breaking this loop that is a trivial code here in the end we are getting the results page which simply means we have a page of results that contains our information about books which is the title and formats and so on and that's nice <clears throat> So we are doing this and uh, if in a given page and a given page contains, a we are iterating through the books inside the page. Unfortunately, we need to check whether this particular book has this format and whether it ends with this extension because there are some bad, bad, bad data inside. So we need to filter it out manually once again, even we have asked for plain text, we need to confirm that. In the end, we are getting this book as a string. <clears throat> okay, I agree that's the very first point when we should think about improvement possibly because what we are doing here in the end is just we are streaming the content of the whole book to a single string which simply means in the end we are allocating pretty a lot pretty big string for representing the result of this http call some kind of maybe streaming should be used here to make it better but still we have a lot more to improve even before we will touch this particular approach so let's stick with this and then we are just doing the very naive code the one that could be written by <clears throat> 
jan level zero or maybe level one programmer however you will you will categorize that so first of all uh, we are splitting the whole string into the separate uh, lines so we are using the results split uh, just splitting it uh, with uh, respect to the end line characters removing some empty entries and uh, trimming all those which are not important and then in the end uh, because we all have also included here a space a white space uh, simply in the end we can think here uh, we are getting the list of words so the whole book is now represented as the list of words uh, that are discovered inside uh, this particular string okay that's uh, pretty easy like uh, i still i believe level zero or one programmer would write it and would not think about any consequences whether it introduces big or small memory overhead it just works like okay we have a huge string with all the text so we are splitting it with respect of the uh, character uh, of end line and the blank space so then we are getting the words and then we are processing the word a uh, particular word by word from this collection that we are getting for doing that we are using the uh, to represent in the end the number all those unique words we are using the data structure which is called tree tree i'm not even sure how it should be uh, pronounced uh, but the tree is a very simple data structure in the end maybe you have listen, uh, you have uh, met this or not the whole idea about the tree is to represent all the words as a tree special type of tree where every node has a child children which are the letters at the particular uh, level so if you would like for example to represent word t you will go to, through t a and a and then you have a node which is representing the word t uh, and then if, if if you will want to for example represent a word two you will go again with the same two node but then to the o node simply having a new node to represent this single word <clears throat> so this is a nice representation of um various words uh, that can be put inside and they will share common path uh simply like you see here t ted and ten are just three notes under the t note so it is more better let's say represented better representation just a plain list of words and we will be using this data structure and uh because we want to count the number of unique works words in the end the number of these those nodes that are representing words will be the result in our case <clears throat> uh, so we have a class for doing that the tree itself is just a generic data structure as you see here that is um, mostly about the key and the key element and by the key i understand here what we are storing inside this tree and this is a string because we want to keep uh, information about particular word this is exactly like in this graph here so uh, if we are this is also a tree that uh, has a key that is string because by the key i understand particular word that is inside uh, every node then we have a key element which is simply information about what type of element we are navigating through node to node and in this case and in our case also they are individual characters so the key element is the single letter which simply means character in the case of c sharp so there is a t o a those are the key elements with the help of which we are navigating from node to node and also t value which is just a 
like any collection, what we are keeping inside a note, it may be anything, like it may be a number, maybe to represent the number of, of, of occur occurrences of the T word, for example. For every word we have a we can have a counter that will simply keep this information. What was the number of occurrences of this particular word? <clears throat> So then we have all the data structure that is round, built around this. Uh, the tree itself is just a set of three nodes with the root. And the tree node is just uh, very simple also. So it has a, first of all, it has a value. It has the key element and it is also having the children, the most important thing in this manner. So it is just having the information about all the children with respect to the key element. So all the children that are from our node pointing to another nodes of these three nodes. So like here, if we have this node, those will be the three children and the key element of every of it, it will be A, D and N. <clears throat> Okay, so that's uh, the data structure itself and some trivial, as you see, methods here, like, uh, for example, uh, enumerate children, which is recursively enumerating all the children, uh, because like in every graph, probably would like to enumerate everything that is under a given node. And other methods in the tree itself, like, for example, um, adding element which will be just enumerating through elements and adding key element by element in a key and for example trying to get an item also will be very trivial because it is just uh, trying to get a note with a given key and trying to get a note with a given key is just iterating through the key and element by element in this key we are trying to recursively get an element, a note after a note after a note going deeper and deeper inside the tree note. As you see here, current note is replaced one by one just to make sure we are digging in into this data structure and we are trying to get the particular word. And uh, okay, so we have this and let's just make an initial run of it because uh, as you see here, the code is available we have the program which is just doing this and i helped myself to make the repeatable results i'm just ending after processing the first page so the very first 20 books all are only processed because then i will be able to compare with different uh, solutions which will be also processing only the very first 20 books how we can measure it. Uh, I'm, for example, using jetbrains.memory because I like this tool and we could also use any other tool, but let's stick with uh, jetbrains.memory as, a, as, a, as I was presenting it also with the help of this particular tool in the course itself. So we have a generational app, the one that I have just presented to make sure that no issues with the tired compilation will kick in. I'm just disabling tired cost compilation, assuming it will work in the end in some warm up environment. So I don't want to have any influence of comparing and uh, measuring something that is running on these lower tires of the JIT. And uh, let's start it. So. It will be just now starting to download those books and processing them one by one. And we are waiting for the response from the server. And here we see that they are processed one after another. And some allocations are apparently happening here as the books are processed. <clears throat> and we are waiting uh, for the first 20 books to be processed. Uh, the number of unique works is also presented. And for sure there are some allocations as you see here because the memory usage is constantly growing and dropping because of the GCs. We see here the GCs as those orange bars. So we have some GCs during the whole time of this application run. Uh, 
maybe 20 or something like that. And the nice thing about dot memory is that we can choose any region between those GCs. And here we have the number of allocations that has happened during this time. And we can see what has been allocated and where. The same things can be visible also in Purview or in Visual Studio. Uh, this is something that I'm, in this case, I'm presenting as a, one of the nicest way of presenting it, but all their tools also allows us to dig in into the same stuff. But what we say, what we see here is uh, like, first of all, during processing those 20 books, we have allocated uh, almost 800 megabytes of data. Pretty a lot, I would say, although obviously GC is working. So the whole abstraction of memory management is working. So because of the GC is kicking in, the overall memory usage in the end is up to 160 megabytes because the GC doesn't allow uh, to grow this memory too big. But that would maybe not the case in case of the server GC. So there is another consideration here, but at least in the workstation mode that we have used, the memory usage is not so big, but we have allocated pretty a lot of data. We have triggered pretty a lot of GCs. And we could now look what should be and what could be improved here. And first of all, we see things like pretty outstanding. Like for example, we see car enumerator, which is allocated over 5 million times uh, and it is consuming and it consumed 160 megabyte of data, <laughs> a car enumerator. And then we can look where it is allocated. So for example, we see that this enumerator is created in the try normalize method when the any linku extension method is used. So we see here, okay, try normalize, any is indeed here. And every this any here, because it is just linku extension, is underneath allocating car enumerator. And that may be not so a big problem, but because we are having thousands and millions, maybe even in the end, calls of this method, in the end, we have 5 million of car enumerators uh, created there. So a lot, a lot of that. A lot of this is happening just because of this any, uh, which can be replaced probably by single for each loop and we will not allocate this uh, 83 megabytes of data. <laughs> also, a get, a get enumerator is also used in the three, mm, get, try get node uh, method, as you see here. So then we can go to try get node method and see what is there. And apparently it is used in the try get item, try get node. So we can go here and here. Uh, <clears throat> not this one. Okay. And here we will in the end also see, okay, in the, yes, <laughs> apparently we have a numerator of uh, car enumerator created here because we have for each loop in a key, which is a string in our tree node. And it is uh, using in the for each loop. And now it may be pretty surprising why it is happening like that. But if you enumerate over a string like that, uh, you are creating car enumerator. Uh, which is a trivial thing for most of the applications probably, but maybe not in our case, which is just calling it so many of so often that we also end up in almost 80 megabytes of allocations just because of that. Then we have strings allocated. That's expected because first of all, the whole book should be allocated inside a string. But if we will see, we will also see that a lot of those strings come from the split method. So uh, when we are using the split, uh, that's something that likes to allocate a lot of memory uh, because then we have to create the new array of strings and all those strings also needs to be allocated. And uh, 
orders uh, will probably come from the processing of HTTP itself. But this split will be repeating here and there in various places. Also, the try normalize again is using the trim method, which is still sometimes allocating a new string because we need to represent a new string with the content that has been trimmed uh, from the beginning or uh, getting rid of something from the beginning or uh, from the end of the string. Okay, uh, so again, uh, first of all, we see those three hot paths. We see a string uh, that is allocated in the split, unfortunately. Then we see array of characters that is used in try normalize. And it is there used directly, as you will see, because unfortunate code is allocating it every time when it is in need of it. So if we will see the try allocate, <clears throat> you will see that in the end, we have here uh, something like that. And this is a trim method, which is expecting params of characters. And we are providing it here nicely, simply as an params of characters, which is underneath translated every time to allocating to allocation of an array of characters. So every time we call it, we allocate a new array of characters that contain those constant in the end values. So again, kind of sanity thing here that sh it should not be on the hot path, but we are always doing this again and again. And uh, one more thing, pretty surprising, three node enumerate children. <laughs> it's something that is apparently somehow related to enumerating is allocating over 100 elements. And this is comes from the enumerate children method. Uh, which simply means probably that enumerate children because of how it is written and uh, it is called from the count method as you will see it is many many times called from the count method the count method for enumerating all the nodes in our tree is constantly and recursively calling this method enumerate children and enumerate children is written as uh, is written as I will show you uh, simply as something that is yield returning. So in the end, it is using a state machine to represent the thing that we are returning. So every call of this method is producing this state machine of the iterator yield returning the successive elements of the collections, which is not a problem again, typically, unless we are doing this uh, recursively like here. So we are digging in into a tree all the time, recursively calling again and again the same method, <coughs> the same method <coughs> on the children in of the children of the children of the children. So we have recursive allocation of this iterator here. Even more surprising thing, dictionary enumerator. We have here dictionary enumerator that is again used by the count method directly. Uh, so we have, a, a, because of, of a reason, we have a dictionary enumerator created every time when the enumerable count is ca called inside the tree node enumerate children. And if you look at the code again, we will see that this is because the children is I dictionary. And that may be again a very surprising thing, but this is how uh, enumerators are working in case of a generic approach when we are trying to represent collection as a I dictionary in this case, which retains a struct being boxed later on and interpreted as enumerator by the forage loop. So uh, I'm covering this in details in the course again, uh, just to explain you how it is working and why it is allocating in the end. This is a very nice scenario in which this is happening also recursively. And because of this single line, we are having uh, this number of, we are having 
70, 74 megabytes of allocations. So <laughs> a lot of allocations, like pretty dummy allocations of a numerator uh, of a, a dictionary. That's surprising, really. And then going one by one, we will see that the splitting is a problem and enumerating is a problem. So we could improve things. And one of the homeworks in the, this uh, course is to improve it. Like I'm just presenting this, this code to you and uh, inviting you to find all the problems and give a better uh, code that will be just not allocating so many things. And I really believe after all the lessons that I'm providing, it is really doable to find and understand what can be improved. And that would be one of the, let's say, main goals of the whole course to give you uh, this knowledge in hand. So you will be able to fix it, improve it, measure it, validate whether these improvements make sense or not. So uh, I, I really hope it will happen. Uh, so the very first code was uh, having 750 megabytes. There is a second version that gets rid of enumerating stuff and uh, also improving try normalize method, which I will skip because I want I don't want to prolong this webinar too long. And then we have the best version I would say that is also heavily maybe not so heavily, but it's also using span to get rid of all many of these operations that required splitting things. Because in the end, span is so nice way of representing substring and parts of the strings. Uh, so we could utilize span to this scenario also. I will try to show you the difference, but I see unfortunately network has stopped and the site is not answering so let's try to repeat <clears throat> maybe it will start to repeat maybe it will start to answer okay it is so here we have a version that was using a span and some improvements of all the code, especially in terms of enumerating and this data structure of three node. And as you even see, it is like four or five GCs that has happened that has allocated 10 times smaller number of uh, things. And then we will see that they are mostly the strings by itself, the strings that are simply returned by the HTTP. And now we could think about streaming or not as a way of improving how we get those data from the network. But probably only at this moment I would start to think about it because now I see that this is the only thing that allocates, almost the only thing that allocates because then we have uh, on the second le list we have something again that comes from the network. Then only we have those three data structures that are representing the tree node itself. Obviously, we need the tree node and the tree itself. So some data will be allocated because we need those data. Uh, but this will be really not so significant. Like instead of 800 megabytes, we have 80 megabytes now simply. And almost no temporary allocations are happening. Obviously, as always, this code will be much maybe not much, but as always, we trade some readability uh, for performance. So tree node itself is may, may now less, let's say, uh, mm, flexible because it is getting rid of the generic uh, approach for representing the key. We are just writing the tree node <clears throat> for the string itself, which has this benefit now I don't have time so much now to explain why, but in the end, it is really uh, much better to represent key as a string, not as a generic collection of items. And then we will be using uh, span to represent uh, and operate on those substrings. So instead of using split, for example, we will be processing the result span by span. 
So the core part, getting rid of the things related to splitting and transforming all this stuff will be just, for example, take me a span that is just representing this string that I have downloaded from network, enumerate all lines. This is a very nice extension that has been added in .NET 6. And inside every line, split it uh, with the respect of this character, so with respect of the space, but uh, this split is a special split. It is an extension method that is returning me span split enumerator, and after one of the modules, you will be able to understand why this span split enumerator is so beneficial. So it is a ref struct allowing us to enumerate through elements of original span element by element without any allocations. So we are in the end getting a span uh, that we can get a span that is representing a candidate for a word that can be normalized, but still to normalize, we don't need to materialize this word because we have a span that is representing those characters representing this word. So we can try to normalize it to some buffer that is stack allocated and then I would say only if you discover that this is a new word, only then you can and you should probably allocate a new string to represent this word and to remember it inside the tree node. But only then we need eventually the string. So in the end, I believe this code is not a rocket science as and not as difficult. If you understand spans, and I believe after all my lessons, you should be able to understand him. I hope you will be, uh, um, you, uh, I hope I learned it uh, clearly enough that uh, you will be able to understand it and then write code like that. Whether you should start to write every application like that, obviously not because it is not a, uh, the approach that every domain should be now rewritten to use span and avoiding any possible allocations. But if you are writing something like that as an Azure functions that is processing crawling network uh, and processing many pages that are big, finding something, processing, splitting strings, then you, as you see, you can get rid and orders of magnitude allocations, which will also reduce the memory pressure, the CPU usage, because there will be no GCs. And that is one of those demos that I'm presenting in my course. And that is probably enough. Uh, all this stuff requires 42 hours of talking. So this is only a very short demo of a demo. Uh, trying to convince you that we are doing their interesting stuff and practical one and all with the all knowledge also how to measure it, how to track progress and all this stuff that is really needed to do such a magic. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if I convinced you, but I really tried. And then uh, that's all I would say. Uh, I have also a short slides about why I am a good candidate to talk about all this stuff, but I believe you have watched the previous webinar. So in the end, I can only say that I'm doing this for years and I wrote this book and also talking about a lot recently for years and doing other workshops and online and offline trainings. So I included all the experience about all this stuff and also experience about writing and designing and talking, uh, providing and producing workshops, online workshops. So I have this expertise also. And I believe because of that, it is really worth, although demanding because it is still 42, 42 hours of watching me then probably also doing homeworks so a lot of knowledge for you to make you better programmer simply going from this level zero or one or level two and going up up to the four up to level three not level four i don't expect you will start writing your own gcs after <laughs> this course but if you will start to write memory aware code i would be really really happy 
Okay, and that's in the end all. Uh, if you have any questions, I will look at the chat whether you have any questions at this time, and <clears throat> we will see. Let's see uh, whether you have any more questions. Mm, so the very first one was about the difference to a book. I tried to inline <laughs> answer to this during the whole webinar. Uh, so I will um, allow myself to skip it for now. I hope that it's simply bigger thing and rearranged and provided in much more interactive way. So that makes a difference. Uh, then... Um, That's a very good question. So in general, as you see, my English is also not perfect. So I believe listening to someone which is not perfect at English is better <laughs> for someone that is also not perfect in English. So uh, any level of English is probably good enough. And also, as I said, I was designing it to s for everyone. Like I was assuming that you don't know anything and only you know C Sharp and you know in, the, in general .NET ecosystem a little, so you know what it is and you know Visual Studio, so you will be able to understand examples and demos, but no any, con any particular knowledge from my site was assumed. So for sure, you will understand it. I hope I, uh, that was my goal. Do you plan to publish new edition of Pro that memory management book is one of my favorite questions. Yes, I do plan to do that. Although I'm really afraid of doing that because of the time commitment. And that's really big one. Like I see how much things I should change. And uh, I'm waiting for at least .NET 7 or maybe even 8, but probably at the time of .NET 7, I should start to work on the upgrade maybe next year simply. We will see. Uh, there are topics about value task and the tasks. Yes, as I even showed, there was a there is a part of the lesson about what is the difference and what we believe it gives you. Although in general, it is more about async programming. So the, this topic is much in better in depth covered in async expert because it is not only about allocations, but in general, why value task has been introduced and what are the differences in API, but we have covered that too. Dot .NET 6 has a new data structure priority queue, as far as I know. Uh, mm, no, not aware of any data structure that would be HIP, unfortunately. Uh, so, so the answer is, as far as I know, uh, no. And the last question, do you know if a .NET has a data tree uh, internally? internally because for sure there is no public api whether it is an, an internal implementation i haven't met it during my investigation but it doesn't mean it is not somewhere they're hiding still so maybe it is i'm not sure but implementing it also from memory perspective is very nice exercise as we saw even they are common caveats that we can met because of these uh, recursive calls and recursive enumerations. So it is a really nice exercise. Even if you are not buying this course or attending it, I'm inviting you to try to do that on your own. The data structure itself is trivial. It can be really easily unit tested and performance tested also. So that would be really <clears throat> nice exercise. Uh, could you post the link to your tree over here? Thank you. Uh, yes, I will post it on as a comment, probably here or somewhere, uh, or maybe on Twitter. I'm not sure where, uh, but I will add it because 
as far as I know, it is somewhere publicly available already. I need to find out where, but I will. Hello from Ukraine. Uh, hello, hello. Nice to nice to see you. And do you have any more questions? One hour and fifteen minutes seems like a good time for slowly closing. I really hope you will find this course interesting. As I said, the link is um, uh, in the description of this video. If you would like to see whether whether it is there or not, uh, whether you have any questions, you can also catch me on Twitter on on our Discord, which is, by the way, a good point now to point to, to show you that we have a Discord server. So this is one of our community uh that we are inviting you to be there because we are just discu discussing there about various things not only memory but in general everything which is interesting in dotnet so if you find it interesting if you found this webinar interesting or if you in general like dotnet feel free to jump to discord too and be also there and then probably i will also push use uh, and paste on paste links to this uh, example also on discord as we have a channel there for webinars any more questions <clears throat> if not and i'm not seeing any uh, i would like just to make sure that I'm not disappearing from the internet, so I plan to have more webinars about memory and not only memory, because I like to expand my knowledge and my uh, sharing of knowledge to different topics. So expect me also to, to be in different webinars next times. As Jose is also saying, there is a Rust webinar ongoing uh, we have discussed it previously. Rust is nice language. Maybe I will make a webinar about Rust and how it differs comparing to .NET. Why not? We will see. If you have any other ideas about webinars, also feel free to jump to the Discord and share with me what we could talk about. Um, okay, the very last question. All, all your pictures which you have been posting in your Twitter from that course. Yes, I would say 99%. If they looked like uh, polished, they probably were from the course. Sometimes I was, <laughs> I was posting some drafts, but typically I would say most of the time, yes, they are from the course. Some of them may be from the goodies site. We have the goodies uh, .net of site when we are having some um, free posters about uh, .net related stuff, but I believe you are mostly talking about those from the course because they are um, not so many posters in the end on the goodies. Why I have posted pretty a lot of infographics on Twitter, so there is a big chance they were from the course itself okay thank you very much for being with me it was a pleasure as always i am super happy there were some people and you were listening to me for that long time i hope we will meet somewhere uh, maybe at some conference or uh, if not on the conference at some next online event that we will be doing or maybe webinar or if you will, and maybe you are already attendee of the course, we will see on Friday when I will be doing the live Q&A for the course participants. So thank you very much. Have a nice rest of the week and the rest of the day and see you somewhere soon. Thank you very much. I will be not prolonging this ending anymore. So <laughs> bye. Have a nice day.